to Network Host the African History Network show. It is Sunday, December 17th, 2023, and we are live. I wanted to come on for a few minutes and talk about this topic that um, I want to discuss back on December 7th, but did not get a chance to talk about. And this deals with the Vicksburg Massacre in Vicksburg, Mississippi, that took place December 7th, 1874, December 7th, 1874. You've heard me talk about this before. And um, an African-American sheriff by the name of Peter Crosby was forced out of office, as well as many other um, African-Americans who held political office there in the county. And they were forced out of office by a paramilitary white domestic terrorist group called the White League, the White League, which was founded in uh, March 1st, 1874, the White League. So all this takes place during the Reconstruction era, which is 1865 to 1877. And this is the period of time right after the Civil War ends in 1865 and chattel slavery ends December 6, 1865, when Georgia ratifies the 13th Amendment. OK, so uh, I've talked about the Vicksburg massacre before, and I'm a, uh, not just a talk show host. I'm also a historian, political commentator uh, and lecturer. And I will be teaching uh, another session of my online class, uh, Black Resistance Movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. So I'll be teaching that today. Uh, as well as soon as I finish this broadcast. So if you haven't registered for that uh, online course, you can register for that um, right now. And we have the information in the thread of the broadcast as well as at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. So when we look at the um, Vicksburg Massacre, okay, uh, Zen Education Project has some good information on uh, the Vicksburg Massacre. And on uh, December 7th, 1874, uh, during the Reconstruction era, uh, the Vicksburg Massacre occurred in Mississippi with estimates ranging from 75 to 300 African-Americans were killed. Estimates range between 75 to 300 African-Americans who were killed. Uh, you're going to have white people attack African-American citizens who had organized to defend Peter Crosby, who was an African-American sheriff there in uh, there in that county in uh, Vicksburg. Um, formerly, in, he was a formerly enslaved man and a veteran of the Union Army. Peter Crosby had been forced to resign from his uh, duly elected role as sheriff. OK, now the uh, Zen Education Project cites an excerpt from the book, A Nation Under Our Feet, A Nation Under Our Feet um, by uh, uh, Black Political Struggles in the Rural South from Slavery to the Great Migration by um, historian Stephen Hahn. OK, and here's a picture of the book, A Nation Under Our Feet, Black Political Struggles in the rural South, slavery to the great migration. Okay, now, and when we look at this excerpt uh, from this book, it says most important uh, was the emergence of the White League and of the white line movement more generally in Louisiana and Mississippi. OK, so as, as I stated, the White League was founded um, March 1st, uh, 1874. OK, and you're also going to have a movement called the White Line Movement, which dealt with uh, the racial, the white racial line when it came to politics, the, the white racial line when it came to politics. So. This is during uh, during a period of time when African Americans are acquiring land. We're making large advances. Uh, we are holding political office, getting elected to political office. You have African American men who are voting because of the Fifteenth uh, Amendment of eighteen seventy. Okay, and you have growing resentment from uh, white people, especially in the South, 
uh, towards these advancements that African Americans are making. Okay, and then in 1873, you're going to have what's known as the Panic of 1873, where you have um, uh, an economic collapse, uh, economic depression here in the U.S., and that's going to uh, heighten uh, racial tensions. Okay, and we we see this throughout history when you have heightened racial tent when you have economic depressions, when you have economic strife this uh heightens racial tensions and we we see this here with uh what was originally called the great depression and later called the long depression after the 1929 uh stock market crash which causes uh what uh we normally term as the great depression so if we look at this we go back to this article here from the zen education project most important was the emergence of the white league and of the white line movement more generally in Louisiana and Mississippi. Committed to drawing the racial line in politics and inviting all white men uh, without regard to former political affiliations to unite, okay? Inviting all white men regard uh, without regard to former uh, political affiliation to unite. The White League was first organized in Opelousa, Louisiana, in late April 1874, and then uh, spread rapidly. Okay, and the uh, Opelousa in 1868 is where you have the Opelousa uh, massacre of 1868, which was around voting rights and African Americans uh, trying to vote also. So it was dealing with politics. Now, it clearly built on foundations. The White League clearly built on foundations established by the Ku Klux Klan and the Knights of the White Camellia. The Knights of the White Camellia, uh, Camellia is also another domestic terrorist organization, white supremacist organization, similar to the Ku Klux Klan, but not as well known as the Klan. Uh, it built clearly on foundations established by the Klan and the Knights of the White Camellia. A Union Army commander regarded the White League as a, quote, second edition of the White Camellia campaign of 1868, but was even more directly aligned with the Democratic Party at that time. Now, the Democratic Party at this time is before the party realignment that begins in 1928 with the uh, election of Herbert Hoover, who's the Republican candidate, and the Republicans uh, implement a Southern strategy and appeal to a white Southern segregationists in five former Confederate states to get them to vote for Herbert Hoover as president. And uh, Republicans start pushing African Americans out of the Republican Party, and they're starting to uh, ignore issues and concerns pertaining to African-Americans. So then we're going to start slowly going over to the Democratic Party, because uh, even though we were um, uh, skeptic, skeptic, skeptical of the Democratic Party, but when uh, Franklin Roosevelt becomes elected in the 1932 presidential election, uh, we see the Democratic Party is more receptive to our issues. So we start slowly going over to the Democratic Party. The party realignment is going to complete in 1968 when uh richard nixon wins the 1968 presidential election and uh he runs on the platform of law and order he runs on the southern strategy as well uh he's the republican candidate and he's he's uh running against the democratic candidate which was uh, uh hubert humphrey okay hubert humphrey and uh, Hubert Humphrey loses. We know President Lyndon Baines Johnson does not run for another term who uh, was the outgoing president. OK, so this is before the party realignment uh, takes place. OK, now, indeed, leagues were often little more than local Democratic clubs converted into paramilitary companies. Quote, if the Democratic Party is arrayed against the Negro and the Republicans, end quote, the Opelousa Courier proclaimed, 
quote, it becomes a white league. It becomes a white league and no one uh, can object to its efficient organization, end quote. Now, white leaguers surely recognized that the federal government was losing interest, was losing interest in interfering in Southern politics and sustaining uh, Republican regi regimes by military means. But they also responded to the growing assertiveness of African-Americans with, within the Republican Party, which showed itself in the rising incidence of black office holding. So we have an increasing number of African-Americans who are voting and getting elected to public office uh, during the Reconstruction era, 1865 to 1877. You have about uh, 2,000 African-American men who get elected to uh, public office. Now, there is, as we get deeper into Reconstruction, there is a declining um, desire from the federal government OK, and uh, President Ulysses S. Grant is president at this time. There is a declining commitment from the federal government to continue to get involved in uh, racial conflicts and, and race massacres, racial issues, et cetera, in the South. All right. Uh, the panic of 1873, this depression of 1873, when you have the collapse of um uh, banks and you have the collapse of uh, 89 uh, railroad uh, companies out of 364 railroad companies. You have the collapse of the uh, J. Cook and Company Bank. It starts with the collapse of the J. Cook and Company Bank, which invests a lot of money into uh, building uh, the railroad tracks and they're overextended. So uh, the 1874 uh, midterm elections, Democrats take back control of the House of Representatives for the first time prior to uh, the Civil War taking place. And you have this economic depression that lasts from about 1873 to 1879, okay? When you had the uh, Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, which was passed by Congress, and it was designed to crack down on domestic terrorism, especially in the South and Ku Klux Klan activities who were uh, attacking elected officials, attacking African-American elected officials, killing them and attacking white Republicans. As time goes on, uh, and also uh, President Grant uh, declares martial law in nine counties in South Carolina in October of 1871, utilizing the Ku Klux Klan Act. And this allowed for the newly formed uh, Department of Justice, which was uh, created in 1870 by act of Congress. This allows the Department of Justice to federally prosecute these domestic terrorists. OK, and this and this is what happens. Um, SmithsonianMag.com has a good uh, article uh, dealing with this. And we do a, a lot of this history in, in my classes and we go through this history chronologically. Uh, created 150 years ago, the Justice Department's first mission was to protect black rights. Created 150 years ago, the Justice Department's mission, first mission was to protect black rights. In the wake of the Civil War, the government's new force sought to enshrine equality under the law. Now, this is an excellent article from July 1st, 2020 uh, by Brian Green for, Smith, for uh, SmithsonianMag.com, which is the official uh, magazine of the Smithsonian Institute. And they're cracking down uh, on Ku Klux Klan activity and uh, they're prosecuting hundreds of Klansmen, okay? And you, Ulysses S. Grant in October of 1870, it, well, 1871, I should say, is going to uh, declare martial law uh, in nine counties in South Carolina and these Klansmen are going to be prosecuted, okay? So, but when the Clinton, Mississippi massacre of 1875 takes place, Ulysses S. Grant implements his uh, policy of non-interference. And there's less support to keep, inter to keep uh, the federal government engaged in these conflicts in the South. There's, less, uh, there's a declining amount of support. And there's a declining amount of public support as well. Okay, now... 
White leaguers surely recognized that the federal government was losing interest in interfering in Southern politics and Southern Republican regimes by military means, but they also responded to the growing assertiveness of African Americans within the Republican Party, which showed itself in the rising inc incidents of black office holding. By that time, uh, by that time, two white line counterpart counterparts in Vicksburg, Mississippi, had demonstrated how paramilitary mobilization and very definite intimidation, very definite intimidation could bring electoral process, could bring electoral success, even where black voters held decided numerical sway. So the white league was heavily engaged in political violence against African-Americans to suppress the African-American vote. If anything still held back a full scale white paramilitary offensive, it was removed in the November 1874 elections. Okay, the November 1874 elections. Congressional Democrats won control of the House of Representatives for the first time since Southern slaveholders had rebelled against the national government. So this is during a what was originally termed as the Great Depression. This is taking place during that period of time because of the Panic of 1873. And at the same time, people are saying, well, you keep intervening and spending taxpayer dollars to deal with these black people in the South. OK, by 1876, when you have the presidential election in 1876 between the Republican uh, Rutherford B. Hayes and the Democrat Samuel, Samuel J. Tilden, the unemployment rate had ballooned to 14, uh, 14 percent. OK, so all this is taking place at this time and the progress of african americans gets caught up in this and this political violence this economic depression uh this uh unwillingness of the federal government to keep intervening on behalf of african americans and conflicts in the south this is going to lead to the end of reconstruction in 1877 with the compromise of 1877. So congressional Democrats won control of the House of Representatives for the first time since Southern slaveholders had rebelled against the national government. OK, going back to the beginning of the Civil War, April 12, 1861. Now, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, white liners seem to commemorate the event of uh, the commemorate uh, the November midterm elections and Democrats taking back control of the House of Representatives. White liners seem to commemorate the event by moving quickly to complete the work they had begun in the summer, the summer of 1874. This time, they focused on the county rather than the municipal government, okay? They focused on county government as opposed to city government, which was on, in county government there in Mississippi was almost uh, in in, Vix, in the uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi area, was almost wholly dominated by African American Republicans, including the sheriff Peter Crosby, who was a native Mississippian who had served in the Union Army during the war. Now, meeting in early December, eighteen seventy four, the white the uh, uh, the white line demanded or the white league i should say the white league demanded the res resignations of all of the african-american officials and pressured sheriff peter crosby to yield under what he regarded as a threat of assassination it should say threat as opposed to threat a threat of assassination now peter crosby then headed to the state capitol for help and uh, he was seeking help from the governor at the time, uh, Adelbert Ames. Here's a picture of uh, Governor Ames. Uh, 
Now, Republican Governor uh, Edel, uh, Edelbert Ames of the Republican Party's radical faction turned a sympathetic ear to Peter Crosby and the plight of African Americans. He ordered the, quote, riotous and disorderly persons, end quote, who had expelled from office the legally elected sheriff to, quote, disperse and retire peaceably, end quote, and submit to the legally constituted authorities, submit to the legally constituted authorities. He also instructed a Warren County militia militia company to cooperate with Peter Crosby's effort to regain office and suppress the mob and suggested that Sheriff Peter Crosby Sheriff Peter Crosby should summon a posse for further assistance. Now, Governor Adelbert Ames orders did little to change the behavior or temper of the white people there in Vicksburg, Mississippi. But Sheriff Peter Crosby's call for a posse revealed a strong foundation of loyalty and organizational readiness among African Americans in the surrounding countryside. And you're going to have have a lot of them, a lot of these African American men who are going to uh be part of this posse who are former uh union uh, civil war union uh well, former civil war veterans as well. You're going to have that also, okay? Um now with dispatch owing to the churches, political clubs, and other institutions of black community life, a major mobilization took place. So you have all these African-American organizations who are organizing this posse to help uh, uh, Peter Crosby uh, regain his office, but also help other African-Americans who were forced to resign as well churches, political clubs, and other institutions of black life. As several hundred African-Americans marched in three columns towards Vicksburg, Mississippi, even Peter Crosby feared the consequences and tried to turn, uh, turn some of them back. It was too late. It was too late. White people opened fire and despite some brief standoffs, the African-Americans were forced to flee. For another 10 days, some of the uh, young white participants joined, uh, joined, by reinforcement, by, joined by reinforcements from across the river in Louisiana, stayed on the warpath. Stayed on the warpath. Now, when the smoke cleared, at least 29 African-Americans have been killed and a great many more have been wounded and terrorized. The seat of government remained in the hands of the white liners. And Peter Crosby briefly held, well, he was briefly held as a prisoner. He was compelled to resign from office yet again. Governor Adelbert Ames called the state legislature into a special session and together they succeeded in convincing President Ulysses S. Grant to send a company of federal troops to quell the disturbances in Vicksburg, Mississippi and to reinstall Peter Crosby as sheriff. But Peter Crosby's days in office were numbered, and so too it appeared with those of Republicans over much of the state of Mississippi. For the several month white line campaign in Vicksburg, uh, Mississippi and Warren County amounted to a rehearsal for redemption in Mississippi. This amounted to a rehearsal uh, for redemption in Mississippi. So President Grant is going to send in troops. Now, this is 1874, because when the Clinton, Mississippi riot of 1875 took place, uh, Ulysses S. Grant took a hands-off approach to it. 
Torchlight processions, paramilitary drilling, the disruption of Republican uh, meetings, the harassment of African-American workers, the intimidation and assassination of African-American leaders, the driving off of local office holders and the disabling of armed, of armed black resistance, the disabling of armed African-American resistance, all of which made their appearance in, in Vicksburg, Mississippi in 1874. All of these elements were to come into uh, concerted use in 1875 in counties that previously had quote unquote safe Republican majorities. So there's a turning of the tide. There's a political turning of the tide. There's an escalation in political violence taking place, especially in the South. And there's also, once, like I said in the beginning, there, there was also a declining commitment from the federal government and from Republicans in the North to continue to intervene into these racial conflicts in the South, okay? Give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like uh, on this broadcast. Let's look at this piece here dealing with the panic of 1873 that I talked about. So we uh, can understand uh, the context in which all of this is taking place. And if you haven't registered for uh, the online history course that I teach on Sundays called Black Resistance Movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. Uh, be sure and register for that uh, right now. We'll post a link here. We have the information on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, cause I'm teaching uh, a session of that class. As soon as we finish this broadcast here today, I'm running a little late. I was going to start the class at two 30 PM Eastern standard time. So we're running a little behind. Um, we have the information on the homepage of our website. And then we have the, um, we have our bundle pack of, uh, classes where you get, um, it's our, we extended our black Friday uh bundle pack promotion it's 76 percent off you get uh my two online history classes that i teach including black resistance movements from the haitian revolution u.s civil war civil rights movement and black power movement 1800 to 1968 okay you get that as well as um Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So you get my two online history classes that I teach, and each one is like 13, 14, 15 weeks, okay? So it's about close to 30 hours each of content or, or more. You get that, and you get 15 of my lectures in digital download format. So the uh, digital download uh, bundle pack, uh, African History Awakens the African Mind from Mental Death, you get all that uh, on sale for hundred dollars. The two online courses and the fifteen uh, digital download lectures. Okay, so register for that right now. It's a limited time only. We have that uh, right on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. The first class that I teach, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understand the transatlantic slave trade. So we just concluded that class a couple of weeks ago, but. All the content is archived. So as soon as you register, you can watch that entire course. And then uh, this is the current class that I'm teaching right now, Black Resistance Movements, okay? If you just want to register for Black Resistance Movements or uh, the other class, you just want to register for those classes by themselves, you register right here, that's $60, but the bundle pack is, is $100, okay? In today's class, Black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. Well, uh, we just concluded last Sunday. We just finished uh, dealing with World War World War One, 1914 to 1918. Today we deal with the Red Summer of 1919, right after World War One ends and the 25 major race riots across the country. We'll talk about uh, Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And uh, we'll do with Dr. Carter G. Woodson 
and uh, the uh, Association for the Study of African American Life and History, or Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Dr. Carly G. Woodson uh, co-founded that organization September 9, 1915. And we uh, so we'll deal with the period of 1919 through uh, up until World War II. And we'll talk about African American soldiers in World War II. And we know the U.S. gets involved in World War II in December 1941 after the attack on Pearl Harbor. But World War II actually began September 1939 when Adolf Hitler invades uh, Poland. OK, that's when uh, World War II actually begins and uh, the U.S. actually enters in fighting in World War II in December 1941. OK, now let's look uh, quickly here. I want to look at this information dealing with the Panic of 1873 that I mentioned. And the Panic of 1873 is going to also be one of the contributing factors to uh, the fall of uh, the collapse of Reconstruction uh, in 1877 with the Compromise of 1877. Um, since the end of the uh, Civil War in 1865, Railroad construction in the United States had been booming. Now, this is a piece from public broadcasting system, PBS.org, called the Panic of 1873. Now, between 1866 and 1873, 35,000 miles of new uh, railroad track were laid across the country between 1866 and 1873. Okay. 35,000 miles of new railroad track were laid across the country. Railroads were the nation's largest non-agricultural employer. Banks and other industries were putting uh, their money into railroads. They're investing in railroads, okay? And expanding, you're, you're building these transcontinental railroads. You're building these railroads from one side of the country to the other side of the country. So when the banking firm of J. Cook and Company, a firm heavily invested in railroad construction, when this firm closed its doors and filed for bankruptcy on September 18th, 1873, a major economic panic swept the nation. A major economic panic swept the nation. And this is going to be followed by um, 89 of the 364 railroad companies that are going to uh, shut down and file for bankruptcy as well. Now, Jay Cook's firm had been the government's chief financier of the Union military effort during the Civil War. OK, this is this is Jay Cook and company. This is was a bank. This was a major bank at the time. Jay Cook and company then became a federal agent in the government financing of railroad construction. The railroad industry involved a huge amount of money and a huge amount of risk, a huge amount of money and a huge amount of risk. Building railroad tracks where land had not yet been cleared or settled required land grants and loans that only the federal government uh, could provide. Okay. So this is very risky business at this time. The nation, the nation's transcontinental railroad had, had been completed in 1869. Entrepreneurs planned a second transcontinental railroad called the Northern Pacific. J. Cook and Company's firm was the financial agent in this venture and poured money into it. On September 18, 1873, Jay Cook and Company realized it had overextended itself financially and they declared bankruptcy. Mirroring the firm's collapse, many other uh, banking firms and industries did the same thing. This collapse was disastrous for the U.S. economy. A startling 89 uh, of the country's 364 railroad companies file bankruptcy and go out of business. A total of 18,000 businesses failed in just two years. A total of 18,000 U.S. businesses failed in two years. 
And by 1876, unemployment had rose to 14%. So this is a climate that's overshadowing the President Ulysses S. Grant administration. And this is 1874. So this is um, uh, nine years after uh, the Civil War ends. OK, and you, this is during the Reconstruction era where they're trying to uh, rebuild the South as well. And uh, you're dealing with um, integrating African-Americans into society. OK, African-Americans are acquiring land. You have the U.S. Freedmen's Bank. You have the um, U.S. Bank. You have the U.S. Bureau of Freedmen, Refugees and Abandoned Lands that's created in 1865 to help African-Americans and destitute white people. But also the Freedmen's Bank is going to collapse in 1874. Now, the Freedmen's, Freedmen's Bank, uh, you know, it was it was rife with mismanagement and, uh, you know, different things like this. But it's going to collapse in 1874 also. And African-Americans lose two point nine million dollars in deposits when the Freedmen's Bank collapses. Now, an economic cloud settled over President Ulysses S. Grant's second term, and he tried to find a solution that would drive it away. He tried to find a solution that would drive it away. Workers and business people argued over what should be done. Now, President Grant setting a course that would become the hallmark of the Republican Party, which is dealing with big business. President Grant sided with Eastern business leaders and adopted their ideas for easing the crisis. But when President Grant left office in 1877 and, and Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican becomes president, the, uh, the cloud of the Great Depression and the cloud of this economic crisis remained. Now, that same year, 1877, the, 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 this Great Depression set off railroad strikes. So the remaining uh, railroad companies that uh, are still in existence and still operating, some of their workers are going on strike. Workers all over the country in response to wage cuts and poor working conditions went on strike and prevented trains from moving. Now, we know that about 20 years after this, you're going to have the 1894 Pullman workers strike where the uh, workers who work on uh, George Pullman's railroad cars, they're going to go on strike. That You have this massive strike and, and, that's pre and um, that strike was precipitated by the Panic of 1893, which was another uh, depression in this country okay and it's going to be uh a few decades after that after you have the uh, brotherhood of sleeping car porter uh organization founded in 1925 it's going to be after that organization is founded that the african-american pullman porters are allowed to go on strike they didn't go on strike in 1894 because they were not allowed to join the white union okay so, and it's that 1894 labor strike dealing with the railroads. This is how you get the Labor Day holiday coming from that uh, uh, strike and the uh, President Grover Cleveland sending in the Union troops to put down uh, the, the strikers who are fighting in the street. Some of those uh, workers are going to be killed. And as a way to appease that labor movement, He's going to have a, a, a celebration uh, uh, honoring the uh, labor workers. OK, and this is going to be the origins of the Labor Day holiday. OK, now let's continue here. How's everybody doing? How you like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. Also, be sure to uh, register for the online class that I'm teaching today. And if you miss it, uh, it, it will be archived so you can go back and watch it. Uh, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. Okay. And we'll start that class. Uh, 
in a few minutes here at our, at our online school. So it'll be about 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today that um, I teach that class. Okay, now let's go ahead and wrap this up. Also, I'll be on live uh, uh, tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the African History Network show. Okay, we'll be on live uh, the African History Network show. Okay, so President Rutherford B. Hayes was forced to send federal troops to more than half a dozen states to stop these strikes, these railroad strikes, well, uh, stop these railroad strikes from these railroad workers. In the end, the fighting between strikers and troops left more than 100 people dead and many more injured. Southern African Americans suffered greatly during this first Great Depression, this Great Depression of 1873 that lasts to about 1879. Preoccupied with the harsh realities of farming, of, of falling farm prices, wage cuts, unemployment, and labor strikes, the North became less and less concerned with addressing racism in the South. This is what I was talking about. You have all this taking place, all these conditions taking place, and, the, and, and, and you have this economic depression, and there's less and less interest from the federal government to intervene in racial conflicts in the South to help African Americans. White supremacist organizations like the Ku Klux Klan, which was founded December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee, a few days after the 13th Amendment is, is ratified, uh, Christmas Eve, they were founded, which, which had been suppressed through punitive reconstruction legislation starting in 1868, resumed their campaign of terror against African-Americans and Republicans. Violent conflicts erupted including the 1873 Colfax massacre in Colfax, Louisiana. Um, by the time the Great Depression lifted in 1875, Southern whites would, would already be regaining power. And you're going to have that 18, in 1878 in Louisiana, you have what's known as the um, panic, I mean, not the panic, the black ex exodus the black exodus of 1878 when you have um the black exodus of 1878 when you have about 6000 african americans migrating from the south uh, migrating from primarily texas and louisiana out west into kansas and the reason why they were leaving in 1878 is because the Democratic Party won the statewide elections in 1878, and they won control of all the statewide offices. So these African-Americans are leaving because they know the, these white supremacists have taken back control of statewide government. So they're, they're leaving and they're looking for a better way of life out in Kansas. The irony, and we, we deal with the black exodus in, in my class, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, 1800, and black power movement, 1800 to 1968. The irony is, is that these white plantation owners who depended, who one, many of them hated African-Americans, but they needed our labor. They're going to plead with statewide elected officials in Louisiana to beg them to force us to stay. But you but you don't want us and you despise us, but you want to exploit our labor. And then when we leave, you want us to come back. You can't you can't make this stuff up. You go go study the black exodus of 1878. They were called exodusters. All right. So hopefully you learned a lot today. I wanted to talk about the Vicksburg massacre of uh, 1874. And the reason why this history is so important, because this history, we see the continuation of the Civil War and the political violence that brought it into the Reconstruction era. We see a, we see a continuation of that today 
with the January 6, 2021 insurrection and the after effects of it. OK, now this piece right here from time.com and I talk about this in the class as well. Um, this deals with how the history of the Reconstruction era is not properly being taught in schools or not being taught at all. There's an excellent uh, article from Time magazine. A new report finds that uh, 45 states are failing to teach students about the period that shaped race relations after the Civil War. OK, now this came out. uh January 12, 2022, January 12, 2022. And they cited Eric Foner. Eric Foner is one of the top uh, historians when it comes to the Reconstruction era. OK. And Eric Foner said in the aftermath of the insurrection. Well, um, let, me, let me back up. The, the article starts out. It says in the aftermath of the insurrection a year ago at the U.S. Capitol. Many leading historians, many leading historians drew parallels between the violence that we saw on January 6, 2021, and the Reconstruction era, which is 1865 to 1877, the period of political revolution directly, directly following the American Civil War. Historian Eric Foner said, quote, these events were uh, these events we saw reminded me very much of the reconstruction era and the overthrow of reconstruction the reconstruction era and the overthrow of reconstruction which was often accompanied or accomplished i should say i should say by violent assaults on elected officials by violent assaults on elected officials now eric foner is a pulitzer prize winning historian and author of Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863 to 1877. Now, he said this, he made these statements in an interview with the New Yorker magazine published a week after the January 6, 2021 insurrection. Now, this article from Time magazine goes on to say that scholars say that studying the aftermath of the Civil War can help put into context many of the most seminal events in the United States in recent years, from the brutal murder of George Floyd, May 25th, 2020, by police in uh, Minnesota, to the voter suppression laws enacted after uh, black voters, 16.9 million black voters, played a major role in helping Joe Biden and Kamala Harris be elected president and vice president. Keep in mind, that the January 6, 2021 insurrection happened the day after the special Senate election in the state of Georgia, former Confederate state. And Reverend Raphael Warnock was reelected. He, he was uh, elected, uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock. Uh, and then... Um, John, uh, John Ossoff was elected as well to be the two Democratic senators from uh, the state of Georgia. And African-Americans played a major role in that. So there, is, there was a, a rate, there, there was a racial uh, motivation and racial backlash that, that January 6, 2021 insurrection was racial backlash to African-Americans voting in the presidential election, but also that special Senate election as well. And that special Senate election gave Democrats the 50-50 uh, majority in the Senate because Vice President Kamala Harris had tie break, had the tie-breaking vote if there was a 50-50 tie, all right? So that's how the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan passed in the U.S. Senate because no Republicans voted for the bill, all the Democrats voted for the bill, including Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. And Vice President Kamala Harris had the tie-breaking vote. You would not have the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan if 16.9 million African Americans did not vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And uh, Kamala Harris 
uh, if she vetoed that bill, it would not have passed the Senate and wouldn't be it wouldn't go to uh, Joe Biden's uh, desk. OK, and she set the record. She recently set the record for the most tie breaking votes as well uh, as, a, as a vice president, because the vice president presides over the U.S. Senate. OK, now. Uh, but despite the timeliness of the era, ERA, the era in today's climate, many students in American schools will not get a full education on the Reconstruction era until they get to college. OK, but most of them are not going going to go to college in social studies standards for 45 of 50 states and the District of Columbia. Discussion of, of the Reconstruction era is partial or non-existent discussion of the reconstruction era is partial or non-existent according to historians who reviewed the period uh it reviewed how the period is discussed in k-12 kindergarten kindergarten through 12th grade social studies standards for public schools nationwide in a report produced by the education nonprofit zen education project the study's authors say they are concerned that American children will grow up uninformed about a critical period of history that helps explain why full racial equality remains unfulfilled today. Okay, so check out this um, uh, article here from Time Magazine. A new report finds that 45 states are failing to teach students about the period that shaped race relations after the Civil War. OK, it's an excellent, excellent piece. And um, we use this in the class as well. OK, so um, hopefully you learned a lot today. Um, you can also support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App and through PayPal. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. Um, this helps us keep doing the research, stay, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills. We have that um, information on the home page of our website as well. So you can scroll down and we have it right there. Uh, we have the link here. Click on that uh, link. And here's our QR code um, uh, for Cash App. And we go to our Cash App account. Uh, our, our Cash App tag is dollar sign the AHN show, S H O W. When you go to it, it will say Michael. It may show my picture there. These other ones here and others like it are fake African History Network cash app accounts. They've been stealing money from us. I'm still trying to get them shut down. And here's our uh, link here for PayPal as well. All right. So be sure to register for this online class. Register for the uh, bundle. Uh, also, the uh, Black uh, Black Empowerment Friday a weekend uh, bundle, 76% off. You get my two online courses. And these are multiple week courses courses uh and you don't have to be in class live uh, we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded even after the course is over with you don't lose access and you get 15 of my lectures in digital download format you get all that for a bundle uh, uh it's on sale a hundred dollars right now okay it's at our website the african history network.com all right we have to get out of here hopefully you learned a lot today give us a thumbs up give us a heart give us a like on this broadcast Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, and uh, uh, my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Uh, and uh, look out for The African History Network show. Watch me on uh, Fridays on Roland Martin Unfiltered. I just guest hosted on uh, Friday, December 15th. So we're airing some of those clips as well of me guest hosting Roland Martin Unfiltered. Remember, right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. Uh, Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace.